so the clash of Achaean and Trojan troops was on its own. The battle in all its fury veering back and forth, careering down the plains, as they sent their bronze lances hurtling side to side between the Samoa's bank and Xanthus' swirling rapids. That Achaean bulwark against Ajax came up first, broke the Trojan line and brought his men some hope, spearing the bravest man the Thracians fielded, Achaemus, tall and staunch. Eusorus' son, the first to hurl great Ajax, hit the ridge of the helmet's horsehair crest, the bronze point stuck on Akama's forehead, pounding through the skull, and the dark came swirling down to shroud his eyes. A shattering war cry. Diomedes killed off Axidus, Toothrest son, who had lived in rock-built Arisbe, a man of means and a friend to all mankind. At his roadside house he'd warm all comers in. But who of his guests would greet his enemy now, meet him face to face, and ward off grisly death? Diomedes killed the man and his aid in arms at once, Axilus and Calesius, who always drove his team. Both at a stroke he drove beneath the earth. Euryalus killed Dresus, killed Ophelteus, turned and went for Pedasus and Isippus, twins, the nymph of the spring, a barbaria, bore Duke Bucalion. Bucalion's son himself to the lofty king Laomedon, first of the line, though his mother bore the prince in secrecy and shadow. Tending his flocks one day, Bucalion took the nymph in a strong surge of love, and beneath his force she bore him twin sons. But now the son of Machisius hacked the force from beneath them both, and loosed their gleaming limbs and tore the armor off the dead men's shoulders. Balapetus braced for battle against Astialis, winging his bronze spear Odysseus slew Padites, Bred and Percote, and Tuke did the same for the royal Aretion. Ablerus went down too under the flashing lance of Nestor's son, Antilochus, and Elatus under the lord of men Agamemnon's strength. Elatus lived by the banks of rippling Satnios, and Parasus perched on the cliffs. The hero Lytus ran Philacus down to ground at a dead run, and Eurypylus killed Melanthius outright. But Menelaus, lord of the war cry, had caught Adrestus alive, rearing, bolting, in terror down the plain. His forces snared themselves in tamarisk branches, splintered his curved chariot just to the pole's tip, and breaking free they made a dash for the city walls, where battle teams by the drove stampeded in panic. But their master hurled from the chariot, tumbling over the wheel and pitching face down in the dust. And above him now rose Menelaus, his spear's long shadow looming. Adrastus hugged his knees and begged him, pleading, Take me alive, it tried it. Take a ransom worth my life. Treasures are piled up in my rich father's house. Bronze and gold and plenty of well-wrought iron. Father would give you anything gladly, priceless ransom, if only he learns I'm still alive in Argive ships. His pleas were moving the heart of Menelaus. And just at the point of handing him to an aid, to take him back to the fast Achaean ships. One up rushed Agamemnon, blocking his way and shouting out, So soft, dear brother, why? Why such concern for enemies? I suppose you got such tender loving care at home with the Trojans? Ah, uh, would to God, not one of them could escape his sudden plunging death beneath our hands. No baby boy still in his mother's belly, not even he escaped in Ilium, Blotted out, no tears for their lives, no markers for their graves. And the iron warrior brought his brother round. Rough justice, fitting too. Menelaus shoved Adrastus back with his fist. Powerful Agamemnon stabbed him in the flank, and back on his side the fighter went face up. The son of Atreus dug a heel in his heaving chest and wrenched the ash spear out. And here came Nestor, with orders ringing down the field. My comrades, fighting the lions, aid of Ares, no plunder now. Don't lag behind, don't fling yourself at spoils just to haul the biggest portion back to your ship. Now's the time for killing. Later at leisure, strip the corpses up and down the plain. So he ordered, spurring each man's nerve. And the next moment, crowds of Trojans once again would have clamored back inside the city walls. Terror struck by the Argives, primed for battle. But Helenus, the son of Priam, 
best of the seers who scan the flight of birds came striding up to Aeneas and Hector, calling out, My captain, you bear the breath of Troy as Ulysses fighting. You are our bravest men. Whatever the enterprise, pitched battle itself, or planning our campaign, so stand your ground right here. Go through the ranks and rally all the troops. Hold back our retreating mobs outside the gates before they throw themselves in their women's arms in fear. A great joy to our enemies closing for the kill. And once you've roused our lines to the last man, we'll hold out here and fight the Argives down, hard hit as we are. Necessity drives us on. But you, Hector, go back to our city. Tell our mother to gather all the no older noble women together in gray-eyed Athena's shrine on the city's crest. Unlock the doors of the goddess' sacred chamber and take a robe, the largest, loveliest robe that she can find throughout the royal halls, a gift that far and away she prizes most herself, and spread it out across the sleek-haired goddess's knees. Then promise to sacrifice twelve heifers in her shrine, yearlings never broken, if only she'll pity Troy, the Trojan wives and all our helpless children. If only she'll hold Diomedes back from the holy city, that wild spearman, that invincible headlong terror. He is the strongest dog I've now, I tell you. Never once did we fear Achilles so, captain of armies, born of a goddess, too. So they say. But he is a maniac, run amok. No one can match his fury man to man. So he urged, and Hector obeyed his brother start to finish. Down he leapt from his chariot full armed, hit the ground and brandishing two sharp spears went striding down his lines, ranging flank to flank, driving his fighters into battle, rousing grisly war, and round the Trojans whirled, racing to meet the Argives face to face. The Argives gave way. They quit the slaughter. They thought some god swept down from the starry skies to back the Trojans now. They wheeled and rallied so. Hector shouted out to his men in a piercing voice, Gallant-hearted Trojans and far-famed allies, now be men. My friends, call up your battle fury, till I can return to Troy and tell them all, the old counselors, all our wives, to pray to the gods and vow to offer them many splendid victims. As Hector turned for home, his helmet flashed and the long, dark hide of his bossed shield, the rim running the metal edge, drummed his neck and ankles. Now Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, and Tedius, son Diomedes, met in the no-man's land between both armies, burning for battle, closing, squaring off. Lord of the war, cried Diomedes, opened up. Who are you, my fine friend? Another born to die. I never noticed you on the lines, where we win glory, not till now. But here you come. Charging out in front of all the rest with such bravado, daring to face the flying shadow of my spear, pity the one whose sons stand up to me in war. If you are an immortal come from the blue, I'm not the man to fight the gods of heaven. Not even Dryas, his indestructible son like Kyrgyz, not even he lived long. That fellow who tried to fight the deathless gods, he rushed at the Minads once, nurses of wild Dionysus, scattered them breakneck down the holy mountain Nisa. Routed them, strewed their sacred staves on the ground, raked with a cattle prod by like Kyrgyz. <laughs> fool. Dionysus was terrified. He drove beneath the surf, for the sea nymph fate has pressed him to her breast. Dionysus, numb with fear, shivers racked his body, thanks to the raucous onslaught of that man. But the gods, who live at ease, lashed out against him. Worse, the son of Cronos struck like Kyrgyz blind. Nor did the man live long, not with the hate of all the gods against him. No, my friend, I have no desire to fight the blithe immortals. But if you are a man who eats the crops of the earth, a mortal born for death, here, come closer, the sooner you will meet your day to die. But the noble son of Hippolochus answered staunchly, High-hearted son of Tydeus, who ask about my birth, like the generations of leaves, the lives of mortal men. The wind scatters the old leaves across the earth, and now the living timber bursts with the new buds, and spring comes round again. So with men. As one generation comes to life, another dies away. But about my birth, if you like to learn it well, first to last, though many people know it, here's my story. There's a city, Corinth, deep in a bend of Argos, good stallion country, where Sisyphus used to live the wiliest man alive, Sisyphus, Iola's son, who had a son called Glaucus, 
and in this day Glaucus sired brave Bellerophon, a man without a fault. The gods gave him beauty and a fine, gallant traits that go with men. But Proteus plotted against him. Far stronger, the king in his anger drove him out of Argos, the kingdom of Zeus, had brought beneath his scepter Proteus' wife, you see, was mad for Bellerophon. The lovely Antea lusted to couple with him, all in secret. Futile. She could never seduce the strong man's will. His seasoned, firm resolve, so straight to the king she went, blurting out her lies. I wish you'd die, Proteus, if you don't kill Bellerophon. Bellerophon's bent on dragging me down with him in lust, though I fight him all the way. All of it false, but the king seethed when he heard a tale like that. He balked at killing the man, he'd some respect at least, but he quickly sent him off to Lycia, gave him tokens, murderous signs, scratched in a folded tablet, and many of them too, enough to kill a man. He told him to show them to Antea's father, that would mean his death. So, off he went to Lycia, safe in the escort of the gods, and once he reached the broad highlands cut by the rushing Xanthus, the king of Lycia gave him a royal welcome. Nine days he feasted him, nine oxen slaughtered. When the tenth dawn shone with a rose-red finger, he began to question him, asked to see his credentials, whatever he brought him from his father-in-law, Proteus. But then once he received that fatal message sent from his own daughter's husband, first he ordered Bellerophon to kill the Chimera, a grim monster sprung of the gods, nothing human. All lion in front, all snake behind, all goat between, terrible, blasting, lethal fire at every breath. But he laid her low, obeying signs from the gods. And next he fought the Solimai, tribesmen bent on glory. The roughest battle of many ever entered, so he claimed. And then for a third test he brought the Amazons down, a match for men in war. But as he turned back, his host spun out the tightest trap of all, picking the best men from Lycia far and wide, he set an ambush. That never came home again. Fearless, Bellerophon killed them all. Then, yes, when the king could see the man's power at last, a true son of the gods, he pressed him hard to stay. He offered his own daughter's hand in marriage. He gave him half his royal honors as the king. And the Lycians carved him out a grand estate, the choicest land of the realm, rich in vineyards, good tilled fields him to lord it over. And his wife bore good Bellerophon three children, Isander, Hippolychus, and Laodamia. Laodamia lay in the arms of Zeus, who rules the world, and she bore the god a son, and our great commander, Sarpedon, helmed in bronze. But the day soon came when even Bellerophon was hated by all the gods. Across the Alian plain he wandered all alone, eating his heart out, a fugitive, on the run from the beaten tracks of men. And his son, Isander, who by the war god, never sated. A boy fighting the Solomai, always out for glory. And Laodamia? Artemis, flashing her golden reins, cut her down in anger. But Apollocus, Apollocus fathered me, I'm proud to say. He sent me off to Troy, and I hear his urgings ringing in my ears. Always be the best, my boy, the bravest. Hold your head up high above the others. Never disgrace the generation of your fathers. They were the bravest champions born in Corinth, in Lycia far and wide. They are my lineage. That's the blood I claim, my royal birth. Well, when he heard that, Diomedes' spirits lifted. Raising his spear, the lord of the war cried, drove it home, planting it deep in the earth that feeds us all. And with winning words, he called out to Glaucus, the young captain, Splendid! You are my friend, my guest from the days of our grandfathers. Long ago, noble Aeneas hosted your brave Bellerophon once. He held him here, there in his halls, twenty whole days. And they gave each other handsome gifts of friendship. My kinsman offered a gleaming sword belt, rich red. Bellerophon gave a cup, two-handled, solid gold. I left it at home when I set up for Troy. My father, Tydeus, I really don't remember I was just a baby when father left me then. That time an Achaean army went to die at Thebes. So now I am your host and friend. In the heart of Argos, you are mine in Lycia when I visit in your country. Come, let us keep clear.
clear of each other's spears, even there in the thick of battle. Look, plenty of Trojans there for me to kill. Your family, famous allies too, any soldier that God will bring in range or I can run to ground. And plenty of archives too. Kill them if you can. But let's trade armor. The men must know our claim. We are sworn friends from our father's day till now. And both agreed. Both fighters sprang from their chariots, clasped each other's hands, and traded packs of friendship. But the son of Kronos, Zeus, stole Glaucus' wits away. <laughs> he traded his gold armor for bronze with Diomedes, the worth of a hundred oxen just for nine. Now, when Hector reached the Scion gates and the Great Oaks, the wives and daughters of Troy came rushing up around him, asking about the sons, the brothers, the friends, the husbands. But Hector told them only, Pray to the gods. All the Trojan women, one after another, hard sorrows were hanging over them. Soon he came to Priam's palace, that magnificent structure built wide with porches and colonnades of polished stone, and deep within its walls were fifty sleeping chambers, masoned in smooth, lustrous ashlar, linked in a line where the sons of Priam slept beside the wedded wives. And facing these, opening out across the inner courtyard, lay the twelve sleeping chambers of Priam's daughters, masoned and roofed in lustrous ashlar, linked in a line where the sons of law of Priam slept beside their wives. And there at the palace, Hector's mother met her son, that warm, good-hearted woman going in with Laodice, the loveliest daughter Hecuba ever bred. His mother clutched his hand and urged him, called his name, My child! Why have you left the bit of fighting? Why have you come here? Look how they wear you out. The sons of Achaia curse them, battling round our walls. And that's why your spirit brought you back to Troy, to climb the heights and stretch your arms to Zeus. But wait, I'll bring you some honeyed, mellowed wine. First pour out cups to Father Zeus and the other gods. Then refresh yourself, if you like to quench your thirst. When a man's exhausted wine will build his strength, battle-weary as you are, and fighting for your people. But Hector shook his head, his helmet flashing. Don't offer me mellowed wine, mother, not now. You'd sap my limbs, I'd lose my nerve for war, and I'd be ashamed to pour a glistening cup to Zeus with unwashed hands. I'm splattered with blood and filth. How could I pray to the Lord of Storm and Lightning? No, mother. Go to Athena's shrine, the queen of plunder. Go with offerings. Gather the noble older women and take a robe, the largest, loveliest robe that you can find throughout the royal halls, a gift that far and away you prize most yourself, and spread it out across the sleek-haired goddess's knees. Then promise to sacrifice twelve heifers in her shrine, yearlings never broken, if only she'll pity Troy, the Trojan wives, and all our helpless children. Only she'll hold down me back from the holy city. That wild spearman, that invincible, headlong terror. Now, mother, go to the queen of plunder's shrine, and I'll go hunt for Paris. Summon him to fight, if the man will hear what I have to say. Let the earth gape and swallow him on the spot. A great curse Olympian Zeus let live and grow in him, for Troy and high-hearted Priam and all his sons. Oh, that man. If I could see him bound for the house of death, I could say my heart had a goddess wrench and grief. His mother simply turned away to the palace. She gave her servants orders, and out they strode to gather the older, noble women throughout the city. Hecuba went down to a storeroom filled with scent, and there they were, brocaded, beautiful robes, the work of Sidonian women. Magnificent Paris brought those women back himself from Sidon. Sailing the open seas on the same long voyage, he swept Helen off, her famous father's child, lifting one from the lot. Hecuba brought it out for great Athena's gift, the largest, loveliest, richly worked, and like a star glistening deep beneath the others. Then she made her way with a file of noble women rushing in her train. Once they reached Athena's shrine on the city crest, the beauty Theano opened the doors to let them in. Kiseus' daughter, 
the horseman, Antenor's wife, and Athena's priestess chosen by the Trojans. Then, with a shrill wail, they all stretched their arms to Athena, as Theano, her face radiant, lifting the robe on high, spread it out across the sleek-haired goddess's knee, and prayed to the daughter of mighty father Zeus, Queen Athena, shield of our city, glory of goddesses, now shatter the spear of Diomede, that wild man, Hurl him headlong down before the scion gate. At once we'll sacrifice twelve heifers in your shrine. Yearlings never broken. If only you'll pity Troy, the Trojan wives, and all our helpless children. But Athena refused to hear Theano's prayer. And while they prayed to the daughter of mighty Zeus, Hector approached the halls of Paris. Sumptuous halls he built himself with the finest masons of the day. Master builders famed in the fertile land of Troy. They'd raised his sleeping chamber, house and court, adjoining Priam's and Hector's aloft the city heights. Now Hector, dear to Zeus, strode through the gates, clutching a rusting lance eleven forearms long. The bronze tip of the weapon shone before him, ringed with a golden hoop to grip the shaft. And there... In the bedroom, Hector came on Paris, polishing, fondling his splendid arm, his shield and breastplate, turning over and over his long, curved bow. And there was Helen of Argos, sitting with all the women of the house, directing the rich embroidered work they had in hand. Seeing Paris, Hector raked his brother with insults and stinging taunts. What on earth are you doing? Oh, how wrong it is, this anger you keep smoldering in your heart. Look, your people are dying around the city, the steep walls, dying in arms. And all for you, the battle cries and the fighting flaring up around the citadel. You were first to lash out at another, anywhere. You saw hanging back in this, this hateful war up with you, before all Troy is torched to a cinder here and now. And Paris, magnificent as a god, said, Ah, Hector, you criticize me fairly, yes, nothing unfair, beyond what I deserve. And so, I would try to tell you something, please. Bear with me. Hear me out. It's not so much anger or outrage at our people that I keep in my room so long. I only wanted to plunge myself in grief. Uh, but just now my wife was bringing me round, her winning words urging me back to battle. And it strikes me even now as the better way. Victory shifts, you know, now one man and now another. So come. Wait while I get this war gear on, or you, you go on ahead, I will follow. I think I can overtake you. And Hector, helmet flashing, answered nothing. Helen spoke to him now, her soft voice swelling up. My dear brother, dear to me, bitch as I am, vicious, scheming, hard to freeze the heart. Oh, how I wish that first day my mother brought me into the light, some black whirlwind had rushed me out to the mountains, or into the surf, where the roaring breakers crash and drag, where the waves had swept me off before all of this. Since the gods ordained it all these desperate years, I wish I'd been the wife of a better man, someone alive to outrage the withering scorn of men. This one has no steadiness in his spirit. Not now. He never will. He is going to reap the fruits of it, I swear. But come in. Rest on the seat with me, dear brother. You are the one who at heart is unfighting here. For more than all. And all for me. All that I am. And this blind, mad Paris. Oh, the two of us. Zeus planted a killing doom within us, 
So even for generations still unborn, we will live in song. Turning to go, his helmet flashing, tall Hector answered, George asked me to sit beside you here, Helen. Love me as you do. You can't persuade me now. No time for rest. My heart races to help our Trojans. They long for me sorely, whenever I am gone. But rouse this fellow, won't you? And let him hurry himself along as well, so he can overtake me before I leave the city. For I must go home to see my people first, to visit my own dear wife and my baby son. Who knows if I will ever come back to them again. Or the deathless gods will strike me down at last at the hands of our guy fighter. Flash of his helmet, and off he strode and quickly reached his sturdy, well-built house. But white-armed Andromache, Hector could not find her in the halls. She and the boy and a servant finally gowned with standing watch on the tower, sobbing, grieving. And when Hector saw no sign of his loyal wife inside, he went to the doorway, stopped, and asked the servants, Come, please, tell me the truth, thou women. Where is Andromache gone? To my sister's house? To my brother's wives with their long flowing robes? Or Athena's shrine where the noble Trojan women gather to win the great grim goddess over? A busy, willing servant answered quickly. Hector, soon you want to know the truth. You haven't gone to your sister's brother's wives or Athena's shrine where the noble Trojan women gather to win the great grim goddess over? Up to the huge gate tower of Troy she's gone. Because she heard our men are so hard pressed. The Achaean fighter's coming on, and so much force, she sped to the wall in panic. Like a mad woman, the nurse went with her, carrying your child. At that, Hector spun and rushed from his house, back by the same way, down the wide, well-paved streets throughout the city, until he reached the Scion gates, the last point he would pass to gain the field of battle. There his warm, generous wife came running up to meet him. Andromache, the daughter of gallant-hearted Edeon, who had lived below Mount Placos, rich with timber, in Thebes below the peaks, and ruled Cilicia's people. His daughter had married Hector, helmed in bronze. She joined him now, and following in her footsteps, a servant, holding the boy against her breast, in the first flush of life, only a baby, Hector's son, the darling of his eyes, radiant as a star. Hector would always call the boy Scamandrius. Townsmen called him Astyanax, lord of the city, since Hector was the lone defense of Troy. The great man of war breaking into a broad smile, his gaze fixed on his son in silence. Andromache, pressing close beside him and weeping freely now, clung to his hand, urged him to call. Reckless one, my Hector, your own fiery courage will destroy you. Have you no pity for him, our helpless son, or me, and the destiny that weighs me down, your widow, now so soon? Yes, soon they will kill you off, all the Achaean forces massed for assault, and then, bereft of you, better for me to sink beneath the earth. What other warmth, what comforts left for me once you have met your doom? Nothing but torment. I have lost my father. Mother's gone as well. Father, the brilliant Achilles laid him low when he stormed Cilicia's city filled with people. Thebe, with her towering gates, he killed Etzion. And he stripped his gear and sent his smoke to Greece. For he burned his corpse in all his blazing bronze, then heaped a grave mound high above the arches, and nymphs of the mountain planted elms around it, daughters of Zeus whose shield is storm and thunder. And the seven brothers I had within our halls, all in the same day, went down to the house of death. The great godlike runner Achilles butchered them all, tending their shambling oxen, shining flocks. And mother, who ruled under the timber line of woody Placos once, he no sooner hailed her here with his other plunder than he, he took a priceless ransom, so set her free, and home she went to her father's royal halls, where Artemis, showering arrows, shot her down. You... Hector, you are my father now, my noble mother, a brother to my husband, young, warm, and strong. Pity me, please. Take your stand on the rampart here, before you orphan your son, 
and make your wife a widow. Draw your armies up where the wild fig tree stands, there where the city lies most open to assault, the walls lower, easily overrun. Three times they have tried that point, hoping to storm Troy. Their best fighters led by the great and little Ajax, famous Inamaneus, Atreus' sons, valiant Diomedes. Perhaps a skilled prophet revealed the spot for their own fury, whips them on to attack. And tall Hector nodded, his helmet flashing. All this weighs on my mind too, dear woman. But I would die of shame to face the men of Troy, and the Trojan women trailing their long robes if I would shrink from battle now. Nor does the spirit urge me on that way. I've learned it all too well. Stand up bravely, always to fight in the front ranks with Trojan soldiers, winning my father great glory and glory for myself. For in my heart and soul, I also know this well. The day will come when sacred Troy must die. Priam must die, and all his people with him. Priam who hurls a strong ash spear. Even so, it is less the pain of the Trojans still to come that weighs me down. Not even of Hecuba herself or King Priam. Or the thought that my own brothers and all their numbers... All their gallant courage may tumble in the dust, crushed by enemies. That's nothing, nothing beside your agony when some brazen argive hails you off in tears, wrenching away your day of light and freedom. Then far from the land of Argos you must live, laboring at a loom at another woman's beck and call, fetching water at some spring, Messias or Hyperia, resisting it all the way, the rough yoke of necessity at your neck. And a man may say, who sees you streaming tears, there is the wife of Hector, the bravest fighter they could feel. Those stallion-breaking Trojans long ago when the men fought for Troy. So he will say, and the fresh grief will swell in your heart once more, widowed, Robbed of the one man strong enough to fight off your day of slavery. No. No, let the earth come piling over my head, my dead body, before I hear your cry. I hear you dragged away. In the same breath, Shiny had to reach down for his son, but the boy recoiled cringing against his nurse's full breast, screaming out at the sight of his own father. Terrified by the flashing bronze, the horsehair crest, the great ridge of the helmet nodding bristling terror, so it struck his eyes. And his loving father laughed, and his mother laughed as well. And glorious Hector, quickly lifting the helmet from his head, set it down on the ground, fiery in the sunlight, and raising his son, he kissed him, tossed him in his arms, lifting a prayer to Zeus and the other deathless gods. Zeus... All you immortals, grant this boy, my son, may be like me, first in glory among the Trojans, strong and brave like me, and rule all Troy in power. And one day let them say, he is a better man than his father, when he comes home from battle bearing the bloody gear of the mortal enemy he was killed in war, a joy to his mother's heart. So Hector prayed and placed his son in the arms of his loving wife, and Andromache pressed the child to her scented breath, smiling through her tears. Her husband noticed, and filled with pity now, Hector stroked her gently, trying to reassure her, repeating her name. Andromache. Andromache, dear one, why so desperate? Why so much grief for me? No man will hurl me down to death against my fate. <laughs> and fate. No one alive has ever escaped it, neither brave man nor coward. I tell you, it's born with us the day that we are born. So please, go home and tend to your own tasks, the distaff and the loom, and keep the women working hard as well. As for the fighting men, we'll see to that, all who are born in Troy, but I most of all. Hector of flash and arms took up his horse hair, crest, and helmet once again, and his loving wife went home, turning 
glancing back again and again and weeping live warm tears. She quickly reached the sturdy house of Hector, man-killing Hector, and found her women gathered there inside and stirred them all to a high pitch of mourning. So in his house they raised the dirges for the dead, for Hector, still alive. His people were so convinced that never again would he come home from battle, never escape the Argives' rage and bloody hands. Nor did Paris linger long in his vaulted halls. Soon as he buckled on his elegant gleaming bronze, he rushed through Troy, sure in his brazen stride, as a stallion oh, fed at the manger, stalled too long, breaking free of his tether, gallops down the plain, out for his favorite plunge in a river's cool torrents. Thundering in his pride, his head flung back, his mane streaming over his shoulders, and sleek in his glory, knees racing him onto the fields, and stallion haunts he loves. So down from Bergama's heights came Paris, son of Priam, glittering in his armor like the sun, astride the skies, exultant, laughing aloud, his fast feet sped him on. Quickly he overtook his brother, noble Hector, still lingering slow to turn from the spot where he had just confided in his love. A magnificent Paris spoke first, Dear brother, look at me, holding you back all in your speed, dragging my feet, coming to see you so late, and you told me to be quick. The flash of his helmet as Hector shot down. You impossible man. How could anyone fair and just underrate your work in battle? You're a good soldier, but you hang back of your own accord, refuse to fight. And that that's why the heart inside me aches when I hear our Trojans heap contempt on you, the men who bear such struggles all for you. Come, now for attack. We'll set all this to rights. Some day, if Zeus will ever let us raise a wine bowl of freedom high in our halls, high to the gods of cloud and sky who live forever. Once we drive these Argives geared for battle out of Troy.